The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. A recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. It's a vote on the rule covering two bills. One would be debated today. It deals with combating fraudulent asbestos claims. And the other, if the rule passes, would be debated tomorrow dealing with, uh, with lawsuits, with frivolous lawsuits. There will be three amendments allowed under the rule, an hour of general debate on this asbestos bill. And uh, also the uh, House will finish up work they started, a bill they started back in September dealing with an Arizona land exchange. We expect uh, an amendment vote coming up shortly by Ben Ray Lujan of uh, New Mexico, Democrat of New Mexico, and that will be the next vote.
On this vote, the yeas are 223, the nays are 194. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir. Pursuant to the permission granted to clause 2A to rule 2 of the rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, the clerk received the following message from the Secretary of the Senate on November 13, 2013, at 11.24 a.m. That the Senate passed Senate 1499, Senate 1512, Senate 1557. The House will be in order. The purpose is a gentleman from Virginia seek recognition. Speaker, I ask unanimous. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on HR 982 currently under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to House Resolution 403 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 982. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. in the Committee of the Whole on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 982, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to amend Title 11 of the United States Code to require the public disclosure by trust established under Section 524G of such title of quarterly reports that contain detailed information regarding the receipt and disposition of claims for injuries based on exposure to asbestos and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is, is considered read for the first time. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, each will control 30 minutes. The committee will come to order. Those with conversations will kindly take their conversations off the floor. Those in the aisles will take their seats or their conversations off the floor. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. I rise today in support of a bill that will help the, those asbestos victims that must look to the bankruptcy process to seek redress for their or their loved one's injuries. Unfortunately, on too frequent an occasion, by the time asbestos victims assert their claims for compensation, the bankruptcy trust formed for their benefit has been diluted by fraudulent claims, leaving these victims without their entitled recovery. The reason that fraud is allowed to exist within the asbestos trust system is the excessive lack of transparency created by plaintiff's firms. Due to a provision in the bankruptcy code, plaintiff's firms are essentially granted a statutory veto right, veto right over a debtor's Chapter 11 plan that seeks to restructure asbestos liabilities. Plaintiff's firms have exploited this leverage to prevent information contained within the asbestos trusts from seeing the light of day. The predictable result from this reduced transparency has been a growing wave of claims and reports of fraud. The increase in claims has caused many asbestos trusts to reduce the recoveries paid to asbestos victims who emerge following the formation of the trust. For example, the TH Agricultural and Nutrition Asbestos Trust cut its recovery rate from 100% to 70% 
and the Owens Corning Trust sliced its recovery rate from 40 percent to 10 percent. The gentleman suspend for a moment. The committee will come to order. Those of you who have conversations, would you please take the conversations off the floor or take your seats? Having a difficult time hearing the member. Those with conversations will take their conversations off the floor and will take their seats. Still asking those at the back of the chamber if they would take their seats or their conversations off the floor. Gentleman from Virginia will continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In addition, instances of fraud within the asbestos trust system have been documented in news reports state court cases and testimony before the Judiciary Committee. The Wall Street Journal conducted an investigation into asbestos trusts where it found, among other things, that hundreds of plaintiffs filed claims against asbestos trusts asserting one injury while simultaneously asserting a completely different injury before the state courts. Reports directly from many state courts are uncovering similar conduct. For example, in Ohio, one judge described a plaintiff's case as, quote, lies upon lies upon lies, end quote, after discovering that the plaintiff received hundreds of thousands of dollars from various asbestos bankruptcy trusts while alleging in court that a single product caused his illness. In Virginia, a judge stated that a similar case over which he presided was the worst deception he had seen in his 22-year career. The FACT Act, introduced by Congressman Farenthold, will combat this fraud by introducing long-needed transparency into the asbestos bankruptcy trust system. The FACT Act increases transparency through two simple measures. First, it requires the asbestos trusts to file quarterly reports on their public bankruptcy dockets. These reports will contain very basic information about demands to the trust and payments made by the trusts to claimants. Second, the FACT Act requires asbestos trusts to respond to information requests about claims asserted against and payments made by the asbestos trusts. These measures were carefully designed to increase transparency while providing claimants with sufficient privacy protection. To accomplish this goal, the bill leverages the privacy protections contained in the Bankruptcy Code and includes additional safeguards to preserve claimants' privacy. A state court judge with 29 years of bench experience described the privacy protections within the FACT Act as far stronger than those afforded in state court where asbestos plaintiffs often pursue parallel claims. The FACT Act also was deliberately structured to minimize the administrative impact on asbestos trusts. Indeed, according to testimony before the Judiciary Committee from an expert on asbestos litigation and the asbestos trusts, preparing the quarterly disclosure requirements would be very simple and take minutes. The FACT Act strikes the appropriate balance between achieving the transparency necessary to reduce fraud in an efficient manner and providing claimants with sufficient privacy protections. We cannot allow fraud to continue reducing recoveries for future asbestos victims. The FACT Act is a simple, narrow measure that will shed much needed sunshine on a shadowy system. I thank Mr. Farenthold for introducing this legislation and urge all of my colleagues to vote for the FACT Act, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I you know, myself as much time as I might consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Members of the, members of the House, uh, we're confronted with a, a very uh, simple proposition today. What we have here is a piece of legislation that seeks to address a non-existent problem 
and is strongly opposed by asbestos victims. The trusts charged with administrating, administering compensation to victims and privacy advocates, consumer groups, labor organizations, and legal representatives of future claimants. I point out that I have one of the longest lists of organizational opposition uh, that I've seen in a long time, more than 11 uh, organizations, starting with the Asbestos Cancer Victims' Rights Campaign, and then going to the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, the AFL-CIO, the United Steel Workers, AFSCME, Public Citizen, the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, the Environmental Working Group, the Alliance for Justice, the American Association for Justice, and, and uh, many others. Uh, what we are doing here is really beginning this debate by asking who actually supports this bill and why are their interests being put ahead of uh, asbestos victims. To begin with, the bill's reporting and disclosure requirements are an assault against asbestos of victims' privacy interests. The bill mandates that the trust publicly re report information on the claimant that could include their name, address, work history, income, medical information, exposure history, as well as the basis of any payment that the trust uh, made to the claimant. Given the fact that all this information would potentially be available on the internet, just imagine what insurance, potential employers, prospective lenders and data collectors could do with this private uh, information. And so essentially what this bill does is allow asbestos victims to be re-victimized by exposing their health information to the public, including those who seek information for uh, illegal purposes. And so I uh, ask uh, all of the thoughtful members of this body uh, to join me in strongly and vigorously opposing the measure before us today, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan reserves. Gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, at this time, it's my pleasure to yield four minutes to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Backus, the chairman of the Regulatory Reform Subcommittee. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized for four minutes. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Chairman. Uh, I have great respect for Mr. Conyers. Uh, he has been my chairman. He's now my ranking member. Uh, I, too, see this as a very simple proposition. However, there's, I have a different point of view. Uh, I believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think that light uh, can expose things that need to be exposed. And that's really the essence of this bill. This bill is about transparency. Uh, it is about revealing uh, how much people are being paid in claims. America is a country that helps deserving people in their time of need. And for that reason, when we had really tens of thousands of asbestos exposures, which caused serious injury and death, a trust fund was specifically set up to compensate these individuals whose health had been harmed. However, as with uh, almost anything we establish, there are those that would take advantage of it. There are those that would commit fraud. There are those that would abuse it. And that's the case here. There have been inconsistent claims. Trust fund money has been diverted from these victims and from future victims where it should properly go to those with true, uh, to those people that were truly could demonstrate health needs and cause 
Instead, it went, in many cases, to the undeserving. Don't take my word for it. An article published by the Wall Street Journal just this past March revealed that nearly half of all trusts have reduced payments to new victims at least once since 2010, partly in an effort to preserve assets for fu future victims. The same article cited a number of disturbing examples of money being drained from the system by waste and fraud. It's not something we've made up, leaving less to those who are truly suffering. We've had judges appear and tell us about those problems. We've had others. For example, the article disclosed that after virtually no examination and no transparency, over $26,000 was awarded to a person who never existed. It also found that 2,700 claimants to the Manfield Trust alone, just one of many trusts, couldn't have been older than 12 years of age at the time they said they were exposed to asbestos, to asbestos in their industrial uh, job. The FACT Act would combat fraud through sunshine by increasing transparency and accountability in the system. In doing so, it strengthens the asbestos trust fund and system for present and future claimants. It would improve information sharing in the trust funding process while fully respecting privacy. And let me stress that, fully respecting privacy and protecting confidential medical information, which is very important when personal health is involved. As we've said many times, sunshine is a disinfectant. I said at the start of the speech, I'll say it now. This is a common sense bipartisan bill that would help asbestos victims get the compensation they need and deserve by protecting asbestos trust funds from fraud, waste, and abuse. Let me close by saying, commending uh, Mr. Farenthal from Texas, Mr. Matheson from Utah for bringing this bipartisan legislation and uh, urge you to support them and others and bring this uh, bill to the floor and pass it to increase uh, accountability. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself a minute uh, to uh, thank my good friend Spencer Bacchus, a distinguished member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, for participating here on the floor with me. Uh, I want him to know that the privacy part of his remarks uh, are not too relevant at this point because uh, this bill allows the name, uh, the disease, and all related facts to be published, uh, uh, can be picked up on by the internet. And so uh, assurances of privacy uh, are of, of little usefulness here. And I'm so glad to know that Mrs. Sue Vento, uh, our colleague, former colleague, uh, Bruce's widow, is uh, here with us in the gallery, who has been working along with us strongly opposing H.R. 982. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am proud now uh, to recognize Ted Deutsch of Florida, a distinguished member of the committee, uh, for two minutes. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, and I thank my friend, Mr. Conyers. It's deeply troubling to me that today the House of Representatives might vote to pass the so-called FACT Act, furthering asbestos claim transparency act. I urge my colleagues to vote against this bill because it's not about transparency. It's not about accountability. It's absolutely not about justice. The FACT Act is nothing more than a thinly veiled attack on the rights of cancer victims and their families. That's the only way I can describe a piece of legislation that undermines the constitutional rights of asbestos victims and even threatens the privacy of victims and their families. The FACT Act does nothing to protect the rights of victims like Genevieve Basilevac, who was diagnosed with mesothelioma just a few days before her 48th birthday in 2009. 
and widows like Judy Van Ness who lost her husband to asbestos-caused disease. Victims of mesothelioma do not have the luxury of time. This brutal form of cancer is hard to detect until it has progressed significantly and all too often already compromised vital internal organs. Despite the dire implications of this diagnosis, the FACT Act would place additional burdens on victims and even delay court proceedings to the point that a victim would, be, would die before receiving any financial assistance through the Asbestos Trust Fund. If anything, this body should be looking at ways to make it easier to identify legitimate asbestos victims and fast-track their cases. Instead, we're doing the opposite. This legislation might as well have been written by the asbestos industry because it only provides these companies with new tools to evade justice and their responsibility to victims. Even more incomprehensively, the FACT Act would require the Asbestos Trust Fund to turn over personally identifying information about victims and even their children. For the families whose lives have already been torn apart by disease from asbestos exposure, this legislation would create an online website that lists victim-sensitive information including financial histories and even partial social security numbers, I implore my colleagues to recognize that these families have been through enough. There is nothing we in this chamber can do to fill the void that has been left in the hearts of so many Americans who have lost loved ones due to exposure. Uh, 15 seconds. I, I yield the gentleman an additional one half minute. The gentleman's recognized for 30 Thank seconds. Thank you. What we can do is ensure that we have a justice system that protects the rights of victims and puts the constitutional rights of our citizens ahead of special interests. I urge my colleagues to vote no on the FACT Act. And I yield back. Gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, at this time it's my pleasure to recognize the author of the legislation, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for four minutes. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte, and quite frankly, I'm personally offended by the claim that this bill is against victims. It's for the victims. It's preserving the asbestos trusts for those yet undiscovered victims from people who would defraud the system. All we are asking for in this bill, it's a simple, short, two-page bill. We're asking for no more information than you have to supply when you file a lawsuit in any court. We're asking for your name and the basis of your claim. And we're asking that the expenditures would be listed of the trust in a method that people can check to make sure somebody isn't claiming twice for the same injury. We don't have double dippers. This is for the victims. We are going to try to stop unscrupulous attorneys and, who, and folks they rope in from filing false claims. We don't want to stop anybody who has a legitimate claim. The asbestos trusts have been riddled with fraud. It even comes down to Corpus Christi, Texas, the district I represent, where there were early, uh, early cases where federal judge uh, Janice Jack, a Clinton appointee, and a friend of mine ruled that the there were false bad trouble with doctors. The courts are dealing with that. We're trying to deal with multiple claims and bring simple transparency. We're not asking for detailed measures medical information to be released. We're just asking for the basis of the claim. And that's pretty simple information. We're not asking for social security numbers. We're not asking for any financial information other than the amount that's being claimed. This is public record in any other lawsuit in the country. And it's not an invasion of privacy. It's a protection of the system that was set up to compensate victims of mesothelioma and other asbestos-related exposure diseases that don't manifest for years after the exposure. We've got to protect this for future generations. And the FACT Act is a simple two-page bill, leverages all the privacy protections already in the bankruptcy code, and simply asks that we know who's getting what out of these trust so they can't get them from multiple trusts for the same injury or they can't go file a claim uh, in state court. It's to try to stop double, double dipping and fraud. Unfortunately, when these were set up, there weren't enough safeguards in place. They're run by uh, plaintiff's attorneys who get percentages of compensation off of that. So we're trying to get this taken care of. The plaintiff's attorneys have big impact in creating and managing these trusts. And we're just trying to get some simple oversight. Uh, Mr. Bacchus put it 
quite well when he said sunshine is the best disinfectant. We're asking to shine the light of day on these claims so we can protect future victims. We don't want to deny anybody who is legitimate uh, claimant what they're entitled to. We want to get them compensated and we want to make sure there's enough money there for everyone. This is a bill for the victims. It's a bill to stop fraud, waste, and abuse. And I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased now to recognize the gentle lady from Houston, Texas, a member of the Judiciary Committee, Sheila Jackson Lee, for three minutes. Gentle lady is recognized for three minutes. Let me thank the ranking member for yielding. And uh, with all of the protest, uh, I think there is nothing more that we can say than that this is a very cruel decision to move forward with this particular legislation. And it really uh, implodes and violates uh, the process of litigation between plaintiffs and defendants, petitioners, and those who are in opposition, because we have an infrastructure of a court system that allows those who participate in that court system to guide the evidence that is being presented under the representation of their counsel. The Sixth Amendment provides for individuals to have a right to counsel. And what this legislation is trying to do is implode that relationship and ask for information that could be in the regular order of a court process could be given. This is intrusive le legislation under the false guise of transparency and in actuality would invade the privacy of asbestos victims by requiring the posting of personal exposure and medical information online and erect new barriers to victims receiving compensation for their asbestos diseases. This disease, this cancer-driven disease, this, this asbestos-driven uh, uh, disease uh, is a silent killer. For long times, the victims don't even know that they are being impacted by asbestos that is causing cancer. We have witnessed decades of uncontrolled use of asbestos, and even after its hazards became widely known, disease and death still persist because people work in it and they do not know. And so they've been forced to hire counsel merely to provide for their family or to provide for themselves in the waning hours and days of their life. Hundreds of thousands of workers and family members have been exposed, suffered or died of asbestos-related cancers and lung disease, and the toll continues. And yet we have legislation like this that wants to clearly undermine the legal system, the justice system, which means I go into a court, I have a lawyer, there's someone who is opposed to my position, they have a lawyer, and we submit information under the basis of that litigation or that settlement or that negotiation. Why do Americans have to be subjected to another abuse while they're suffering and dying? This is an abuse. 982 is asking for information that can already be gotten. As I indicated, these individuals have been exposed, suffered, or died of asbestos-related cancers. It is estimated that each year 10,000 people in the United States are expected to die from asbestos-related diseases. How much more of an outrage do we have to place on their families and burden to ask them to give information about their sickness and other is issues that are squarely within the realm of their counsel? Call up their lawyer and ask for it. This is an outrage that they have to deal with this onerous provision. Time and again, asbestos victims have faced huge obstacles, inconvenient barriers, veiled by persistent resistance to receiving compensation for their diseases. That's why they organized in the manner that they did, because they were dying, 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 and there was no response. May I have an additional um, 15 seconds? Well, 15 seconds. Thank you. It is particularly galling that many of the major asbestos producers refuse to accept responsibility and most declared bankruptcy in an attempt to limit their future ability. I ask my colleagues to vote no on this legislation. How much more can we put on these poor victims? If you want information, go to their counsel, go into the courthouse, they will provide it. Let's give them relief. I yield back. Oppose this legislation. Gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, may I ask how much time is remaining on each side? The gentleman from Virginia has 18 and a half minutes remaining. The gentleman from Michigan has 20 and one half minutes remaining. I yield myself uh, such time as may consume to respond to the uh, mischaracterization of this legislation uh, as somehow imposing burdens on the victims of uh, asbestos. Uh, it's quite the opposite, quite in fact. First of all, the information disclosed under the FACT Act is very basic. 
and is less information than would be disclosed during the normal course of a state court lawsuit where many asbestos bankruptcy claimants pursue simultaneous claims. Secondly, but they don't tell the bankruptcy court about that, so these trusts need to tell them that. Secondly, the FACT Act includes strong privacy protections, including prohibiting the disclosure of confidential medical records and full Social Security numbers. To be clear, the FACT Act does not require asbestos trusts to require or di nor disclose asbestos victims' Social Security numbers. The FACT Act also leverages existing privacy protections in the bankruptcy code to give the presiding bankruptcy judge broad discretion to prevent the disclosure of information that would result in identity theft or any other unlawful activity. Indeed, a judge with 29 years of bench experience testified before the Judiciary Committee that the FACT Act provides more protection in terms of confidentiality of asbestos claimants records than the legal system is able to do. By requiring the disclosure of basic information regarding claims submitted to the asbestos trust, the FACT Act will facilitate a reduction in fraud that will allow future asbestos victims to maximize their recovery when they will not be able to do that if we continue to have money taken from these trusts for duplicative claims, fraudulent claims, and claims without merit. Uh, and I yield back, or, or I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman, sir. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to yield to the gentleman from Atlanta, Georgia, Hank Johnson, uh, three minutes and uh, indicate uh, his very deep concern for asbestos cancer victims. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to H.R. 982, the so-called FACT Act. The FACT Act would require asbestos victims, or excuse me, it would require asbestos trust to publicly disclose extensive amounts of private information about asbestos victims on a public website. These quarterly reports would have to be they would have to describe each demand the trust received, including the name and exposure history of a claimant and the basis for any payment from the trust made to such claimant. Also required to be publicly disclosed by the trusts are the claimant's home address, work history, income, medical information, and even the last four digits of the claimant's social security number. Any person, including every crook in the world with Internet access, could use this information for any and all illicit purposes. That criminal or mischievous person could be your neighbor. It could be your daughter's ex-boyfriend. You know the one that you never liked and you bought him from coming to the house. It could be a... Co it could be an employee on the job, somebody that's vying for your job. It could be anybody who wants to do harm to you or your family. It's a serious threat to asbestos victims' security and privacy, and it is an unfair and unnecessary advantage bestowed upon the asbestos manufacturers. The truth of the matter is that such information is available to the tortfeasors during the course of the litigation. Federal and or state rules of civil procedure allow a defendant to gain all relevant information about a claimant's exposure during the discovery process. Moreover, a defendant's discovery request should never justify the publication of a plaintiff's entire medical history. Yesterday, I offered an amendment that would have protected the privacy of asbestos victims and their families. But unfortunately, Republicans in the Rules Committee did not allow the House to consider my amendment today. And it's disappointing that my Republican colleagues who pretend that they support Americans' right to privacy are now willing to throw privacy rights under the bus while they stand with big asbestos as they again victimize the victims by trampling on the privacy rights of those same victims and their families. 
Without adding important privacy safeguards, nothing would stop rampant identity theft or the misuse of a claimant victim's personal information, including that victim's entire medical history. Why is it necessary for a claimant to have to give up their right to privacy just because they seek to recover damages arising from exposure to asbestos? Uh, Fifteen more seconds. Thirty more seconds. Gentlemen, recognized for additional 30 seconds. Thank you. Asbestos victims who seek compensation for their injuries should retain the same privacy protections as other patients as well as other people making claims for personal injury. I yield back. Jim from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, at this time I would like to yield two minutes to uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Parenthal. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, take a moment to address some of the claims that my friends and colleagues on the other side of the aisle had made. The uh, FACT Act is a simple, there's two pages of text to the FACT Act. There's no requirement of any action whatsoever by the victims uh, of asbestos. The trusts are the only ones that are required to do something. And let me just read you exactly what the requirement is. It's simple. It doesn't include a broad release of personal information. It's very simple. A trust described in paragraph 2 shall, subject to section 107, file with the bankruptcy court not later than 60 days at the end of every quarter a report that shall be made available on the court's public docket. Uh, with respect to such quarter. It describes each demand the trust has received from, including the name, exposure history of a claimant, and the basis for any payment from the trust made to such claimant, and does not include any confidential, does not include any confidential medical record or the claimant's full social security number. All we're asking for in this bill is that the trusts let us know who they're paying the money to and what they're paying it for so we make sure people don't double dip so there's plenty of money there for the future claimants. Our, I will indeed. Yes, sir. Uh, individually with that level of information that you just uh, described. It gives you their name and potentially a part of their social okay. security number. Thank you. It is not their full social security number. It's not their confidential medical record. Well, it's the, the basis of their claim. Would the gentleman yield? I will indeed. Part of your medical record goes into that uh, public file. Is it not correct? It's a limited basis of the claim. The so, claimant. So the gentleman is incorrect. There's no part of the medical record. It's just the basis of the claim. It would be simply is claiming a metho mesothelioma from exposure at this location. It's that basic information that would allow other courts to determine that the person who is making the claim is not double dipping, has not already made that claim. Time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I would like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, a uh, distinguished member of Judiciary Committee, Steve Cohen, two minutes. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> There's one fact that's indisputable, and it's the procedure by which this particular bill came to the floor. And that's a procedure whereby the majority had three witnesses, the minority had one. And none of the witnesses were victims. There are two major asbestos victims groups. They would be the people most interested in preserving the funds for victims. The Asbestos Cancer Victims Rights Campaign and the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. One is headed up by a former member of this House's widow, Mrs. Vento. His husband, Bruce Vento, Congressman Bruce Vento, died of methicillioma. They opposed this bill, but the fact is, indisputably, they were not allowed to testify. If this bill indeed was for the victims, the victims should have had an opportunity to testify. The chairman of the subcommittee of which I am the ranking member valiantly tried to rectify that error, Mr. Backus and allow them to testify, but was overruled. And the fact is, the procedure that brought this bill to the floor was flawed, and accordingly I submit the bill should be flawed, because the victim should have had the opportunity to speak. And if it's for the victims, it's for, for preserving funds, 
The people who are proponents shouldn't have been afraid of the victims' organizations going on record and giving testimony and testifying. So this whole proceeding today is conceived in an attack on the victims, not allowing the victims to speak, and not allowing transparency in the hearing process. This is allegedly about transparency. It's not. It's about covering up and not allowing freedom of speech from the people who are most affected, who've had loved ones die from methicillioma. I yield back the remainder of my time. Chairman yells. Gentleman from Virginia. Speaker, I yield myself such time as Mr. Chairman. I yield myself such time as I can assume to uh, respond to the mischaracterization of the process followed in the Judiciary Committee. The FACT Act and the problems it addresses have been the subject of three separate hearings. One before the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution on September 9, 2011 on the issue generally and two legislative hearings before the Judiciary Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, Commercial and Antitrust Law, one during the 112th Congress and another this year on March 13. The minority used these opportunities to call witnesses that were representatives from the asbestos plaintiff's trial bar to voice their concerns with the bill. In fact, the minority called the same witness for two out of the three hearings. Now they claim that asbestos victims were never provided an opportunity to testify. The Judiciary Committee provided ample opportunities to include asbestos victims' views on the legislation on the record, and there are many letters and statements from asbestos victims in the record as a result. Additionally, the committee offered a special procedure to asbestos victims in order to provide an occasion for the victims to personally inform members and staff of their views, which they refused. It has become necessary to act with expediency and move this important legislation forward. Each day that passes is a day where fraudulent claims can be prosecuted against the asbestos trusts, thereby reducing the recovery to legitimate asbestos victims. This legislation will benefit victims by reducing fraudulent claims and ensuring that asbestos trusts provide the maximum recovery to future asbestos claimants. Be happy to. You explain to me then why the victims were never allowed to testify on the record in this Congress, never given an opportunity, even though the subcommittee chairman valiantly and heroically that tried is to rectify reclaiming that. my time. That is not accurate. The claimants were offered a process where they could come and speak to the members of the committee in and private, their staff not a and, hearing, and but in private. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have the time. Gentleman from Virginia controls and the time. The minority had the opportunity to have an asbestos victim testify if they wished to do so and chose instead to have a plaintiff's attorney who had already testified in a previous hearing do so. I reserve the balance of my time. Jim reserves. Gentleman from Michigan. You want 30 seconds? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, to the gentleman from Tennessee 30 seconds. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for 30 Thank you, Mr. Seconds. Speaker. We had one witness. The majority has three witnesses. Ours had to try to explain the legal effects. The fact is, the proponents of the bill who claim it's for the victims should have the right to have the victims be there. The special procedure they had was an in-camera hearing, not on the record. That's not right. You want to propose something for the victims, you give them an opportunity to testify on the record. And they all oppose the bill to a one. I yield. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries, two minutes. It's okay. Thank the gentleman the, from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank the distinguished uh, ranking member for his leadership. This uh, bill represents an unjustified corporate giveaway being built on the backs of hardworking individuals from all across this country who in many cases were unwittingly victimized by asbestos exposure. It is an unwarranted, unnecessary, unconscionable effort to benefit big business and the asbestos industrial complex, which in many instances has unleashed mesothelioma, lung cancer, and other diseases of mass destruction on Americans all across this country. 
who were hardworking and, in most instances, simply trying to make a living for themselves and for their families. Now, it's being done, allegedly, to create greater transparency and in the name of litigation reform. Yet the record reflects that there is no evidence of systematic fraud, no evidence of systematic waste, no evidence of systematic abuse, no evidence of systematic overpayment to victims of asbestos exposure. This is wrong. It's shameful. It's a bill that's dead on arrival in the Senate, and that's why I respectfully urge all of my colleagues to vote no. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself uh, one minute to respond to the allegation that uh, fraud has not been documented. Fraud has been documented in news reports, state court cases, and testimony before the Judiciary Committee. The Wall Street Journal conducted an investigation that found thousands of disparately filed claims. Court documents in many states, including Delaware, Louisiana, Maryland, New York, Ohio, Oklahoma, and Virginia, attest to widespread fraud. Additionally, the Judiciary Committee heard testimony over the course of three hearings during which witnesses repeatedly testified that fraud existed within the asbestos trust bankruptcy system. Keep in mind that the fraud reported to date has been in spite of the lack of disclosure that, does not per, per, the, that, that currently pervades this system. The increased transparency of the FACT Act introduces will go a long way in, over, in uncovering previously undetected fraud and preserving assets for future asbestos victims. And now it's my uh, pleasure to uh, recognize and yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for two minutes. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of the FACT Act. This bill aims to address a fraud problem and ensure that true asbestos victims obtain maximum recoveries for their injuries. My district is home to many asbestos lawsuits and currently a lack of transparency has led to fraud in the asbestos bankruptcy trust system and diverted millions of dollars away from those who should have the ability to receive these recoveries. This lack of transparency discourages the free flow of information resulting in fraudulent claims that deplete funds that are intended for legitimate victims. This bill requires these trusts to file quarterly reports which include the claimant's names, basis for the claim, payments made, and the basis behind those payments. It protects privacy by prohibiting disclosure of sensitive medical records and social security numbers. In order to help ensure future victims will have access to the money they deserve, these problems cannot be allowed to continue. This is why I stand today in support of the FACT Act and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased now to yield to the leader of the Democratic Caucus, Ms. Pelosi, one minute. Gentlelady from California is recognized for a minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding and for his leadership on so many issues. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as you know, the debates that we have on the floor of the House affect millions of Americans, their families, senior citizens, veterans, students, and children. We all bring stories of men and women and families from our districts, the challenges facing our neighbors, the urgent need to solve them. Today we address an issue that takes the lives of thousands of Americans each year, ex asbestos exposure. Wait, we do not have to look back to only to our districts on this scourge. We only need to look into the lives of some who have served in this body. I'm very honored today, as I know my, some of my colleagues are as well, that Susan Vento, a wife of our former colleague Bruce Vento, who served with such distinction in the Congress with some of us uh, some years ago, uh, is with us. Uh, Bruce Vento uh, was affected by asbestos exposure. It took his life. Uh, I wish to place in the record uh, Susan Vento's letter with your, uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Speaker, and just to say 
that in the letter, Susan says, during the consideration of this legislation in the Judiciary Committee, two other women who have uh, uh, been affected by the ravages of asbestos and I requested to have a chance to testify about how the legislation would affect people like us. Our request was denied. To, to, to date, no one a victim of asbestos exposure or affected family member has been allowed to be heard on this legislation. The only people who would be directly affected by this bill have been completely shut out of the process. It goes on to say the so-called FACT Act, and this letter doesn't say the so-called, that's my characterization. The letter says the FACT Act dra uh, drastically erodes the decades of work Bruce, that would be Bruce Bento, and so many of you have invested in helping those who could not help themselves. If this bill passes, it will be a, a serious setback uh, for Americans who expect their elected representatives to work on their behalf. Instead of helping those who suffer from the diseases caused by asbestos, it will reward those who have perpetuated this disease. Uh, with your, without objection, I wish to submit the full context of the letter in the record. General Lee's request is covered by General I would also Lee. like to talk about another of our colleagues who was affected by this, Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy. Carolyn McCarthy serves in this